This video is brought to you by Sporlin. Quality, integrity, and tradition. Yeah, that is a problem. 51 PSI and the unit says 73 PSI. So there's something wrong with that transducer. We got approvals and we are here. It's an early morning. We're gonna be uh, doing a crane lift, placing this condensing unit and putting a new evaporator. So what I'm gonna do to make things go smooth that way I don't have to bring my recovery machine on the roof is we're gonna do a pump down, front seat the receiver, tuck my gauges in the cover, screw it back down, lift it off and do the recovery on the ground. And then that way we don't gotta drag my recovery equipment up onto the roof. So we're kind of in a time crunch. I got guys downstairs getting ready to demo the evaporator. We got a new evap, new condensing unit, and hopefully a new line set too. Actually, I didn't even have to put my gauges on it. I'm gonna kind of cheat wait for the low pressure control to shut it off. I just front seated the valve and left the cap on um, because they're Schrader ports. We needed a way to access the system and once I cut the lines open, I'll, I won't be able to connect to that port right there if I had it front seated. So um, yeah, so it's just pumping down right now. So it, uh, I front seated the receiver, it pumped down, the low pressure control shut the system off and then I just cut the lines. Uh, the refrigerant's trapped at the receiver. We're gonna turn off the electrical, disconnect that and then lift down the condensing unit. Again, I'm trying to move as fast as I can. I went ahead and undid the bolts for the condensing unit while I was waiting. So yeah, that's where we're at. All right, we got a unit coming down right now, and then we're gonna hook up the old one and move on with it. And we are left with a new heat craft unit. Uh, the plan is to use 448A. This is a medium temp beer walking. Um, it's gonna go pretty much in the same location. I plan on running a new line set, at least at this point right now, but we gotta open up this uh, roof penetration, make sure we can access everything. We'll also have to run some two by fours across that. I think I brought some so that way we can uh, support the load of the condensing unit using the same platform. We got the old evap out. This thing uh, pretty corroded. I mean, it's not complete. It's not as bad as the condensing unit. The condensing unit was horrible. The condensing unit is this one that was all loose. And I said it was like loose on the things. So we're currently getting ready to recover the charge right now in the trailer, so. All right, we got the condensing unit mounted. I just cut the two by fours across. The condensing unit doesn't weigh nothing, so it's not too much of a load for those. Uh, opened up the penetration and the butt heads that built this place filled this with expanding foam. It's a pain in the butt. I gotta fish out all this crap now without cutting wires and stuff like that. Sometimes these people are silly. Who knows, man, you know what? Be honest with you, I may just drill a new penetration just because I don't want to deal with that. That actually sounds like a really good idea. I hate drilling penetrations in roofs, but this would be super easy because we're on top of there walking right now. I could come out and do a 90 straight down. I might just do that. We'll have to take some measurements. What I'll do is I'll measure the opening of this in relativity to where I think the hole might go and then go downstairs and measure it out to make sure it's in a good spot before I drill a hole because fishing that foam out is going to be a pain. Well, it's not as open as I thought it was going to be. It's kind of tight. We can get on the other side of that pipe over there, but my line set is all the way down at the very end where that red uh, soda line is. It's way past that, way down there. This is going to be a challenge for sure. Very, very challenging. Holy moly. So this yellow jacket tubing bender, it's the ratcheting tubing bender. If you get the reverse adapter, look at that. Look at how close I got those two 90s. It doesn't usually work out that way. I was actually surprised that I got it to work, but that is clean. I like that yellow jacket bender for sure. So we're working on moving it over here. It is not gonna be perfect. This is a retrofit job, so it's not gonna look like a new install, but we're gonna do our best. All right, so we got our, our line bent and then we got to make a connection right here. So that's cool, it'll work. We'll slide the insulation on, then we'll strap it to that two by six or two by 10 or whatever that is, two by eight. So we're gonna do the three eighths now, bend that out. All right, so we are uh, pretty much ready to braise. We've got everything bent. And yes, it looks a little funky, but once we insulate it, it'll all clean up and come together. This is soft copper, so it's very pliable. Um, the unit still has a nitro charge in it. We got to release the nitro charge and then we're going to purge the system with nitrogen while we're brazing. And yeah, that's where we're at. It is always good when there's actually nitrogen in the condensing unit. That means there's no leaks. So it's funny, we get this far and then we go to test to see if there's nitrogen. <laughs> right, so inside the box, we got a line set coming down. We got a P trap. We're going into the coil and then we just got to cut off that 3 8 connector 
go into that. Very important when you're doing these QRCs or beacons, you gotta remove the suction line temp sensor or you'll melt it, it goes right there. So we remove it, we're gonna uh, energize the coil, get the uh, TXV opened up, and then we'll purge nitrogen and braze. All right, so we're all piped, and uh, my coil's running, we got power turned on. I know that flashing, but that's the frame rate. So we're all hooked up electrically. We still gotta clean up a lot of stuff. We've got, we use the existing penetration from the old line set, because the refrigeration lines were on that side, so then we'll just seal it up. We've got this one, we drilled a new penetration here, and then uh, we actually used the, the hole from the old electrical for one of the bolts, and then we'll seal that up too. But yeah, I'm gonna go up on the roof and get the nitrogen flowing, and then we'll come down here and braze this. And we're gonna do this trick carefully because we're gonna do these welds first, or braze joints, slide on the insulation, hold it back with the tubing cutter, and then do these ones right here, and then let it slide on. And remember, this one doesn't need a spot for the expansion valve because it's an electronic valve. So I grab some of the wet rag, the Viper wet rag, we wrapped it all on that, so that way. And then uh, this black bushing moved it out of the way, so that way it's not gonna melt. So um, like I said, we're gonna do this braze joint, this braze, oh, actually no, we're gonna do this braze joint, this braze joint first, and then we'll slide the insulation, then we'll come back and do the other ones. All right, I'm a freak and I literally take my mirror and check every braze joint just because I want to be sure. Yes, it takes me a little extra time, but that's how I roll. I check every braze joint, always have. Um, and yeah, I know I go heavy on my solder. I always have. I feel more comfortable doing that. Um, and remember, I am brazing with nitrogen. So, so we got those ones done. I'm going to let them cool and then we'll slide on the insulation and everything will be straightened out, guys. It looks crooked. We'll be able to straighten it all out once I get it all insulated and everything so and you can see once they cool they clean up really nice and look nice and solid no problems uh save these caps too i always actually save these and throw them in my toolbox because the caps are great for when you're sliding insulation on you don't got to worry about taping it up and getting the glue from the tape on the line or anything so all right we're gonna uh, start putting this insulation on and then make those last two braze joints all right so push the insulation over put the little uh sensor in there and then we're going to put the foam tape they've got some foam tape that it comes with right there we'll wrap the foam tape around the sensor uh, we'll clean this up I was able to straighten up the lines a little bit more we'll seal up this penetration going up so we're getting there all right we're going to go through and program this real quick so we go to program A through E we're going to go air defrost the refrigerant is going to be 48 48 48A so it's 448A Box temp, oh, you know what? I think I screwed up. Box temp, let me double check. Super heat, I think I was supposed to hit enter. It's not a slave, no. Uh, two defrosts a day. We're gonna do six defrosts a day, enter. Let's see, I forgot I have to hold the enter button. Okay, DFF is the defrost time. We're gonna do 20 minutes, enter. I think I gotta hit enter, I can't remember. DFT, defrost termination temperature, we're gonna leave that at 45. DFS, I know it's kind of probably hard. ALH, that's an alarm, I'm not worried about it. ALL, I'm not worried about it. ALT, not worried about it. F through C, let's check it. It should say Fahrenheit, it does. FN5, it says off. Okay, we're in cooling mode. Let's go through it again. A through E, that's air defrost. Good. Refrigerant, 404. That's right, we gotta hit. Enter to store it. Enter, there you go. Box temp 35, superheat we didn't change. SLA, DFN, 60 frost a day. DFF, 20 minutes. I might, I'm gonna change that to four defrost a day. All right, but you guys get the point. We got a uh, nitrogen pressure test going on right here. Uh, we're gonna give it a few minutes. I really don't anticipate any leaks, so I think we're gonna be fine and we'll get the vacuum running in a few minutes. What I'm trying to do is we rush through this, not rush, but I wanna get the vacuum running so we can go take a lunch and then we can just let it run in the vacuum. We've got everything else for the most part done. We've just gotta tidy up and seal the penetrations and stuff. All right, I'm an impatient person. I can't wait any longer. We dropped 0.4 PSI, so. I'm cool with it. We're going to go ahead and get the vacuum pump running. 
I just closed the gas ballast because we're gonna go away. We're at about 1400 microns right now and I have this side shut off. Initially, I used it to pull the system down for the initial pull down, but then I backseated the valve so we're not pulling from this anymore. We're only pulling from the suction and I've got my Schrader, I mean my um, micron gauge on the liquid line. So we're pulling all the way from the suction back up against to the micron gauge so that way we're getting a true vacuum reading of the system. So, so far so good. All right, so we're still pulling through, all right? We're at 289 microns and I'm gonna shake the compressor and agitate the oil and see if we can get the nitrogen to boil out of the oil to, you know, pull out of the oil better. Again, just proving the point that nitrogen will get trapped in the oil. There was nothing else in this system besides nitrogen. Came from the factory with nitrogen. I purged with nitrogen. Still nitrogen in the oil. All right, I'm just about done with the vacuum and uh, I'm, I actually am done with the vacuum and I'm getting ready to uh, put my gauges on the unit to charge it. Um, sometimes I use probes, sometimes I use my gauges. So in this situation, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull an evacuation on my manifold gauge set before I open it to the system because my manifold gauge set potentially has a lot of air and moisture in it. So I have not opened up uh, the king valve right here and I have not opened up this uh, VCRT vacuum core removal tool. So I'm just pulling against the gauges to get a vacuum down and then we'll uh, go ahead and open it up and charge the unit up. All right, uh, the factory says maximum charge on this unit is 5.5 pounds. So I set my uh, units to pounds only because if it says 5.5, that's not five pounds, five ounces. That's 5.5 pounds. Notice something too, we leave our micron gauge on the system, okay? Um, and uh, we take it off because this micron gauge can handle positive pressure. So we take it off when the system has pressure in it. I've opened everything up. We're ready to put our refrigerant in. We're gonna put it in on the high side. I've already purged. I'll do it again just to be safe. Okay, we purged our liquid. You're using 448A. And that's it, we're gonna go, here we go. You know what I should be doing, to be honest with you, I should have this shut and I should be charging into the receiver instead of uh, letting it flow all the way through the system because that way we don't get a big old surprise on the suction valve of the compressor when a bunch of liquid comes up. So we should be charging like that. There you go. Put as much as we can into the system. We hit high pressure on our Chingus right here, so that's good. So now there was no potential of letting any air into the system. Good, and we're just charging it up right now. We're at 2.5 pounds, and the max charge is 5.5. That's what we're gonna put into this system. And that they're saying the max charge with a pump down receiver is 5.5 pounds. This is a rather small receiver, so that does kind of make sense. And then what we'll do too is we'll do a pump down test and mark the refrigerant level for the next guy when we're done. I went ahead and turned on the disconnect switch, and mind you, it is pumping down, so we can go ahead and test the low pressure control right now to see what it shuts off at. Something's not right, because it's not shutting off. There's a problem. So we'll have to figure that out. That's why we test things. There's a problem with the low pressure control, so we'll figure that out right now. The reason why we commission things is to, to, to find mistakes, potential mistakes on installation and things like that. This was a simple one. I had another person up here and they miswired this unit. That's all, nothing bad. What they did was they wired the line voltage to the load side. So that's why it never shut off because it had three phase of the compressor at all times. So I simply need to switch these three wires right here to the line voltage side of the contactor. That's all. So I'll do that and then we'll test the rest of the system and finish charging it. I rewired it and uh, all we gotta do is turn it on and it should not turn on. Okay, that's correct. All right, so we should have three phase power at the top of this contactor. Two oh eight. Two oh eight. Two oh eight. So we've got three phase power now. It's not running, and that's simply because I have it pumped down. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, 
open up the king valve on the receiver and finish charging this unit now. I am not a fan of the sight glasses that come in these heat craft condensing units. I do not, I, I'm such a fanboy of the Sporland stuff. This is a factory unit. It comes with these Sun Hua, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, I don't know, whatever company. But they're, they're so wish-washy, you know? Uh, these heat craft units use a Corel electronic expansion valve. Uh, I mean, I guess they don't have to use everything all name brand. I just, I just don't care for these sight glasses. They look difficult and they're different to me, you know, and I just don't like change. I'd rather have a spoiler. And in all honesty, uh, I didn't sell them this unit. The customer purchased it themselves, but I would have rather put a flare dryer here with a flared sight glass to make it easier for replacement next time. Anyways, we're still at 3.5 pounds. Sight glass is flashing. I'm gonna add refrigerant. So I get a clear sight glass, but I do know that uh, we're gonna put 5.5, but I just wanna see at what point we clear the sight glass, so. We cleared the sight glass at about 5.1 pounds, and the factory's calling for 5.5, so we're gonna go ahead and put in the 5.5, and then we're going to uh, pump down the receiver and check the liquid level. All right, let's see if the camera picks this up. My unit pumped down, it went off on an error. E6, if you guys, I don't know if the frame rate's working. It's 46 degrees in here and it's got an E6 error code. And if you look on the side of the thing, it says E6 is low superheat during cooling. Well, um, it's possible that it went off on an error because it uh, had been running for so long and it had no superheat at all possibly and eventually it just went off. So I need to reset this error is what I need to do. So without knowing how to do this off the top of my head, Clear, maybe? Yeah. No, I don't want to do test. Again, I guess I should get the instruction manual out. Reset. Let's see if that does it. E6. Test. I don't want to test. What the heck? Let's see what this does. Okay, there we go. We're off. 47, so we're waiting for cooling mode. So, oh no, it's still reading E6. So, reset. It's on a delay now. There we go, we just turned on delay. So it's running. So let's go in here and do monitor. What is my superheat at right now? My superheat's at 21 degrees, so it's definitely shouldn't be too low right now. Monitor. Okay, cool. So we're good. We're going to go ahead and uh, let it go back to normal and finish charging. So we're going to do a pump down test now because we put the 5.5 pounds in here. While it was actually pumping down, I went ahead and put the rest of the refrigerant in real quick before it shut off. So we're going to front seat the king valve while still having the high side pressure gauge on there. That way we can make sure that the system doesn't go over pressure. Okay, this is our refrigerant soft plug right here. It's actually labeled, it's stamped 430 degrees, which is the safety limit temperature of that receiver. What we're gonna do once it pumps down, we're gonna take a heat producing device and pass it up and down a couple times. And we're gonna take our fingers and find the temperature change and that will be the liquid level. It's very important, like I've always said, that the heat producing device does not exceed that 430 degree temperature. And the receiver, it literally only takes like three or four passes. It's not like we're gonna sit there and heat it up till it's cherry hot or anything, so. I do not have my thermal camera with me, but I can clearly take the back of my fingers and my temperature change is right here. The figures, the factory said 5.5 pounds, and that's right at the 80% or three quarter mark of the receiver. I know 80% is not three quarters, guys, but yeah. It's just, it's right there at the three quarter mark. So we're gonna go ahead and mark this with the paint marker with the refrigerant type and go ahead and write the refrigerant type all over this unit. And we're going to watch this thing come down in temperature. So that's not too bad. Marked it for the next guy. So that way you can see that's where I left the liquid level on 114.20, 448A. And I guess I should write 5.5 pounds maybe just so that they we know. But yeah, we're gonna write it up here and then we'll, uh, open up the king valve and let it run. Now I don't have any clamps on here showing you guys what line temperatures are, but this is our 448A and the the pressures of our 448A are damn near similar to what R22 was. Notice our 
uh, condensing temp, 87 degrees. It's currently about 65 degrees outside, uh, which is in line because that would give us about a 20 degree uh, condensing temp over ambient or TD across the condenser, which is about accurate for a micro channel. Um, 68 suction pressure, 37 degree evaporator. My box is probably, I'd guess about 45 degrees right now. So we'll go downstairs and look at what the superheat setting was. I went ahead and marked really good on the receiver, marked right here, marked right there, and wrote on both the top lid and the side lid, the refrigerant charge and what's in there. We're still really flooding back on our compressor. So we'll go check the superheat down at the evaporator. It is cold coming back right now. So we'll go check on that. So unit's done, it's running, but it, it shut down on uh, low superheat again. So I'm gonna need to go down there and figure out what's going on. I need to look at that suction temperature sensor and see if maybe we have a failed temperature sensor. I'm hoping it doesn't have anything to do with the transducer or the expansion valve. Honestly, on these QRC systems, uh, this is probably the only time I've ever had a problem. They're usually really easy. Uh, the other thing too is we still need to support that line. I'll get someone back up here and uh, get that thing supported but all right let's go figure out what's going on with this uh coil all right this is strange because i'm not seeing anything wrong so if i go to let's start back at the beginning sue superheat where that's cooling mode 42 degrees in the box my superheat currently right now is five degrees uh see yeah we're running kind of low right now okay so it's a minute ago was at 15. suction pressure ah it is not 77 psi suction pressure that's our problem we do not have 77 psi we have uh it's like 50 psi we'll have to verify that let me put a gauge on this guy yeah that is a problem 51 psi and the unit says 73 psi so there's something wrong with that transducer for your information, there is a Schrader port underneath the pressure transducer. And uh, pulled it off and it kind of makes me wonder, I can't remember what I pressure tested to. I wonder if I got the pressure too high on this. Because it actually tells you right here, do not exceed 150 PSI. I can't remember what, what pressure I pressure tested to. But anyways, um, local supply house had one. I got one of my guys going to get it right now. He'll be back in 10 minutes. So we'll get it put on there and hopefully that solves the problem. All right, now it's reading accurate. We're at 21 PSI G, 21 PSI 22. So, okay, we're gonna let the thing run and make sure it doesn't shut off on a safety again, but it was just this bad pressure transducer and it's very possible. I'm gonna review my footage because I don't remember what I pressure tested at. So we'll have to see, but. Luckily, my supply house had it. I'm probably going to stock these just in case. But all right, so we're going to watch this thing come down. So things don't always go as planned. Um, on that one, you know, everything was going smooth. It seemed like, you know, all was good. I did have that little hiccup the first time that I noticed that we had the low superheat error message. And I thought it was just simply because I had let the system run for like two hours in a vacuum or two and a half hours or whatever it was in a vacuum. And it was theoretically in the cooling mode because I have seen something weird like that. And I, for some reason, I thought that that's what, what was going on, but it turns out that no, it wasn't what was going on. So my assumption is, is that when I pressure tested the system, I went up to 175 PSI and I believe that ruined the pressure transducer. It's very interesting though to think that only 25 PSI above the limit killed that pressure transducer, but it was clear when I popped the transducer off, put the new one on, it immediately read the right pressure and all was well after that. So, you know, um, sometimes you screw things up. Uh, the, the only hopes that I can get is, is that I've learned from this and, you know, and I'm hoping I can educate you guys and teach you not to do the same thing that I do. Like I said, guys, these videos that I make are simple mistakes that I have made over my career. Uh, that one cost me about 250 bucks, I think, or something like that is what that pressure transducer cost me. And, you know, of course, can't charge the customer for that because that was my mistake, you know? Um, that was an interesting one, but you know, other than that guys, I mean, going through the installation, you know, nothing too crazy, you know, try to use some common sense when you're, um, you know, removing the equipment. I, you know, I was a little bit disappointed in the attic access. I kind of 
alluded to that in the video. It was a little difficult to get up in there. And granted, there was room to crawl in the attic. It wasn't that that I was afraid of. It was that the room was very small in that to be able to take a 7 8 inch line set and maneuver it and make a bend up in the attic. It was really tight, but we were able to do it, um, you know, and, and it all ended up being okay. It just made for a long day because of that pressure transducer and just the little mis little things that we ran into. Um, and that was just a small box. I think that was just like a one horsepower condensing unit or something, you know. Um, but, you know, we just, uh, we, we try to move on from the mistakes that we made. You know, there was no fault of heat craft in that pressure transducer failing. I can't give them bad press for that. That was my bad. I'm, I'm pretty confident it was my bad at least, you know. I mean, right on the side of that evaporator, it said 150 PSI. Don't pressure test over that. And I clearly, I went and reviewed the footage, went to 174 PSI, I think. So, you know, kind of sucks, but it is what it is. And I guess uh, the rules about, you know, pressure testing to certain numbers when you're using transducers, you know, you got to be careful about that. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much it, guys. I really, really appreciate you guys taking the time to watch these videos. Do me a favor. Leave me some feedback down in the comments. Let me know what you guys think. Let me know. You know, tell me if you think I did something wrong. Tell me if you liked something. You know, I, I'm always interested in reading the comments and I do read every single one. I may not answer every single one, but I do acknowledge them when I go through and I give them a heart and a thumbs up. I do that to every comment that I can, um, you know, just to acknowledge that I read it, even though I'm not going to be able to take the time and, you know, maybe necessarily answer every single one. Uh, just for your information, if you don't already know, live streams Monday evenings at 5 p.m. Pacific time where I usually recap some things and talk about these videos. Um, I had uh, recently, if you guys did, I'm sure you did see it, but I just recently uh, completed part four of the How We Live the HVACR Life, the series that I've been doing with my wife. That uploaded earlier this week. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it, guys. Uh, other than that, we will catch you guys on the next one, okay?